Okay, so um, I hear that the, the lab was a little rough. So uh, you know, debugging is never easy. So you know, uh, don't be uh, don't be frustrated. And uh, there's plenty of time after midnight tonight. So I assume that nobody needs to sleep. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to continue and uh, uh, talk about the particular techniques. And um, uh, honestly, I have not really decided exactly how many, how much of the uh, material gonna, uh, I'm going to cover. So I'm going to just do uh, play by play and then see um, if we have the right pace. But the ultimate goal is for you to be able to uh, do the lab assignment next week. So uh, Albert is here to keep me honest and make sure that I cover all the concepts before I, I uh, uh, take my flight. So um, the, sec the first technique that I'm going to be, oh, I'll just wait for a couple minutes for people to uh, settle in. Good. So the first technique that I'm going to talk about is this uh, parallelism, uh, parallelism scalability transformation. Um, invariably, when we convert some algorithms into parallel algorithms, we oftentimes will run into um, you know, what, atomic operation bottlenecks. And I'm going to explain to you, uh, with a class of applications, how people typically deal with this kind of problem. And in general, it's what we call the uh, scatter to gather transformation. So a very common uh, sequential computation pattern is that you have, let's say, an input. Okay, the input can be fairly large. And then you have a doubly nested loop. And this doubly nested loop will iterate over input. And then uh, the inner loop will iterate over all the output. So essentially, you will take each input and uh, scatter your um, uh, effect to the output, and then you take another input and you scatter your effect to all the output. This is a very common ca calculation in molecular dynamics, uh, you know, uh, uh, simulators and so on. And um, one quick example here is an MRI reconstruction example. You take um, essentially the uh, case-based data from a non-uniform sample, and then you would uh, do a uh, essentially a, uh, a, a linear uh, interpolation uh, contribution to some uh, uh, regularly um, uh, uh, spaced grid points so that you can do a fast Fourier transform on it. And for many of you, um, you know, in this group, who, uh, in this room who have experience with fo uh, fast Fourier transform, you need to have you know, essentially a Cartesian uh, based uh, space distribution in order to do that fast Fourier transform and get meaningful result. And so this is um, a fairly uh, widely used kind of computation pattern in quite a few application domains. The input data it, in this case is the scanned points, and uh, we call it M, so that's the outer loop. The output data is N, uh, it's regularized scanned point, it's input, uh, it's N. And uh, in the inner loop, and the complexity of the algorithm is m times n, and um, the output tends to be more regular than input. In this particular case, it's absolutely true because the point is to regularize your input. So you will have all these uh, spiral scan data, and then you you know essentially put uh, uh, generate the regular space uh, output point. And there are many other um, applications. And um, most of them actually have what we call the cutoff property. That is, um, each input point will have a range of output point that it would uh, affect. It will not affect every output point, and we're going to come back to this point later. So we're going to uh, first do a very simple form where every input affects every output, and then we'll uh, go into the cut cutoff case, because the cutoff case will require binning techniques, and that will be one of the uh, lectures on Friday. So the scatter um, parallelization is fairly straightforward. Um, you know, uh, it's essentially the way I describe the um, the uh, uh, the outer loop in the uh, sequential code. So we will take each thread to handle one input. Okay, so every thread uh, will process one input, and it will actually go and um, uh, scatter the result of that input to all the output elements. 
So every thread works on behalf of one input point. This is also the reason why we call this input-oriented parallelization, because the threads are essentially on behalf of one input point. And um, the scatter-based approach is very straightforward, but it can be very, very slow. The reason is, um, if you look at the thread execution, all the threads, will, you know, all these parallel threads will all come and try to update um, the zeros element. So thread one, thread two, thread three will all go and up, uh, update that first element. Whenever this happens, remember we're, uh, we need to use atomic operation to make sure that we don't lose the results. So the atomic operation will essentially force all the updates from all the threads to serialize. Okay, and then um, so you will you will have a fairly long chain of additions, and uh, then you uh, all of them will get in line to the second one, and then uh, they will do all the um, you know all, uh, all these um, all the second element together and so on. And this is a very bad behavior because the entire crowd go into one place, right? And they they all queue up after they're done. They all go to the same place again. They all queue up. So it's not a very good behavior at all. And it's actually worse for many of the GPUs, and if you understand how the hardware actually works. Um, in the earliest GPU hardware, um, the atomic operations are done in the uh, DRAM, okay, in the, in, in the DRAMs. So what, what's happening with each atomic operation is that you need to go to the DRAM and um, uh, with a DRAM delay, and then uh, fetch the initial um, you know, value. And then you, you need to do a uh, kind of an um, uh, addition to the value. And then you will need to write it out to the um, uh, external DRAM. So all these operations take long time to, you know, uh, to, to happen. So uh, the DRAM value needs to go through the DRAM access delay. And then you will go through the on-chip routing network. And then, uh, so then you can do that addition. And then you go through the on-chip net uh, routing network, you go out to the DRAM, and eventually complete that operation. And then the second one comes in. So this can be a very, very long uh, the process. That's the reason why if you use a, uh, you know atomic operation in one of the earlier GPUs, this can be a disaster. Okay? It really can have detrimental effect on your code uh, performance. There are some hardware improvements in the past couple of generations. Um, the the, the uh, GTX two, uh, 280 or GT200 uh, chip actually in, uh, enabled uh, atomic operation on shear memory. So these are the, the, the on-chip memory that are shared between threads of a single block. So uh, when you do atomic operation on the uh, shear memory, the shear memory is so much closer to the, uh, to the computation unit that um, you're going to just have a very, very small internal routing delay. And then um, you, know, well, you, can, you can just fetch it and then uh, do the addition and, do, um, and uh, write it out. So the, um, the overall delay, uh, if you use shared memory, is actually dramatically reduced for, uh, for the computation. However, they still get serialized. Okay? You still lose the parallel, uh, parallelism. It's just that like it's not as bad as before. And with this type of um, you know, delay, then we can start to consider using uh, atomic operation for certain type of data distribution. And I'm going to come back to that point later. Okay? But for this type of computation, it's still going to be very slow. Okay? Some of you will probably ask me the question about Fermi. And, uh, so many of you know that Fermi actually started to have uh, L2 cache on chip. And um, the, the most recent SDK allows you to do atomic operation on the global memory, but the cache will actually cache the, um, the atomic variable value. So in effect, you will be doing an atomic operation on chip in the uh, L2 cache. So um, this L2 cache is not quite as close to the execution units as the shared memory, but it's, it's not bad. Okay, so it's, it, it has a somewhat moderate uh, latency compared, you know, well, somewhat longer latency compared to the shared memory, but um, it's still much, much better than, um, than uh, uh, DRAM. So it's a median latency, but uh, it's, it's still serialized, 
And um, uh, for some algorithms, this can be acceptable. So you know, uh, that's why um, quite a few people have used, um, you know, have changed their algorithm for Fermi to use atomic operation rather than output-oriented scatter operation. But there's some, there's a threshold, and you know, uh, hopefully we'll get to that uh, trade-off uh, before the end of the school. The alternative to, that will make your parallelism much more scalable is the gather parallelization. So if you uh, look at um, the way to visualize gather uh, um, parallelization is that every thread works on behalf of an output. And this is also you know, well, similar to the owner computes rule if you're familiar with MPI you know, uh, programming. So because every thread is going to be writing into one uh, uh, one or uh, multiple uh, individual sort of privatized output uh, uh, locations, they don't need to use atomic operation to get out of each other's way. And, but rather, uh, the threads will go and look at all the relevant input values and then sequentially, remember this is a single thread now, so the thread will sequentially accumulate all the effects uh, to the output from the input points. So you will see a loop within the thread to go through all the um, you know, uh, necessary input to update that output. Okay, so that's the picture I want you to have in, the, in, in your mind. Whenever you have a scatter you know, parallelization, you should see that there's a one input into the, uh, into the thread, and then the thread will be you know, updating multiple outputs. Whenever it's a gathered parallelization, you will see a single output from the thread, and then you will get multiple inputs from the, uh, you know, uh, uh, from the input data. So gather can be very, very fast in the, uh, in the GPUs. In general, um, gather gives you, you know, a much higher throughput, but it actually has other side effects. And uh, we're going to come, come to those points later. All the threads can read the same input element. And this is a very, very desirable behavior in the GPU. Because when all the th threads um, are trying to write into their first output oper uh, operand, they will be use, uh, using the same input data. They're all going to the same input location, right? And you said, you know what, well, you just told us if you're writing into the same location, it's, it's extremely bad. Why would it be so much better if they all go into the same input location? Because the in, when they all go into the same input location, you can fetch that data once, and then use the data for all the threads. And that automatically give you a large number of uses or floating point operations for that data you just fetched. Remember that 28 number that I showed for Fermi? So if you use this kind of programming, you, will, you can get really, really close to that number. So that's part of the reason why um, if you use the, um, the, um, the VMD program uh, from uh, uh, Carl Shelton's group, the electrostatic calcu uh, potential calculation is about 300 times faster than uh, the previous generation uh, because they actually use exactly this pattern on the, uh, on the CUDA uh, GPUs. So um, why is scatter parallelization used rather than Gather. So you're going to ask me, you know, well, if there's such a big difference, why would people ever want to use scattered parallelization? And the reason is, in practice, scattered parallelization is a lot easier in terms of writing that piece of code. Okay, this is unfortunately one of those uh, situations where if you want to have scalable parallelism, your code is going to be more complicated. And I'm going to, I promise you before the end of the lecture, I'm going to actually make some comment about the fact that you cannot avoid doing this for, G, for CPU programming moving forward either. Okay, so you know, there's no way to avoid this, uh, whether you're doing CPU programming or GPU programming uh, from this day on. So in practice, the reason why um, get scattered parallelization is a lot easier to write as, uh, you know, uh, in terms of coding is, um, you know, uh, um, in, in practice, not all the input elements will affect all the output elements. So, and also the output tends to be much, much more regular than input. 
So if you write a piece of code that takes an input <coughs> element and then um, you know, look at the input element, you, it will be very easy for you to quickly identify all the output elements that need to be updated. Whereas if you look at a piece of output, it's in general very hard to find all the input elements that should be looked at. Okay? So that's the fundamental reason why if you look at some, you know, I would say beginner code, whether it's sequential code or parallel code, they always start with an input-oriented programming. Well, um, so, you know, uh, um, whenever, um, you know, uh, we, we need to, you know, do uh, gather parallelization, we need to regularize input elements so that it's easier to find all the elements that affect the output element. So that's why we're going to actually have a, a fairly uh, uh, substantial lecture on uh, how we can do binning effectively for the, CPU, uh, for the GPUs. And then um, can, uh, it can be even more challenging if the data is, is highly non-uniform. In my opinion, this is going to be eventually the, um, the biggest hurdle um, for all the parallel systems. When we have these data distributions that are not very nice, you know, it essentially can defeat any kind of parallel uh, execution. There are applications such as graph algorithms that I have not seen any algorithm that is are bulletproof. That is, you can always generate some type of graph with some edge distribution that defeat the parallel execution and give you slower execution than uh, sequential execution. So for this lecture, we assume that all the elements affect all the element, uh, elements just so that we can get some of the basic principles started. So um, I'm going to be using the molecular uh, modeling uh, ion placement pro uh, uh, process to, you know, to, to kind of uh, illustrate the, um, the technique. And um, uh, in the simulation, essentially, um, you know, we, we need to establish these molecular structures with all the atoms and uh, produce a uh, electrostatic field, and then uh, we need to place these ions into the uh, simulation to make the simulation realistic. And um, uh, so, so um, the, the solvent and the ions are added into the bare bone, um, you know, molecular structure. You know, after we uh, we establish them. So the step one of the process is to take the original molecular structure and calculate the electrostatic potential. Um, you know, well, due to all the, the existence of, of all the atoms in the molecular structure, and then so that we can have a uh, electrostatic potential map, and then uh, and this is the most time-consuming process, and that's why it's it's going to be the focus of our example. Once you have that map, then you can take these individual ions and uh, place them into the uh, you know uh, find the voxel containing the minimal potential value, that's where the, the, the stability, the, the stable location for the ion should be. You add the ion in there, and then you add the effect of the ion on this potential map, and then you place another ion and another ion. This process used to take about three months. And um, so for a large scale molecular uh, dynamic simulation, so, um, you know, just placing the ions properly into the simulation to set up a, uh, you know, a, um, a simulation for a large scale uh, simulation used, used to take about three months. So John Stone told me that uh, a lot of the grad students were set, you know, were essentially, you know, were set up the, um, the, uh, the simulation and let it run, uh, you know, the, let this placement algorithm run and take a vacation. So unfortunately, after the speed up, that went away. So a lot of grad students were not exactly happy about that. But you know, well, so there are some, you know, <laughs> uh, think there are always both sides of things when you, know, when you, uh, when, when you make things quote unquote better. It may not be always better for everyone. Um, so uh, the, oh, just to, to give you a quick overview of the, um, you know, the, this direct uh, columbic summation process where we calculate the electrostatic uh, potential map, so uh, one way to calculate this is uh, on a grid is essentially you know uh, have all the atoms you know this is just one way and they're uh, they're uh, cut off and uh, multi grid you know, uh, level kind of algorithms that um, uh, uh, hopefully we can get to by uh, Friday and then for each lattice point you will sum up the potential contribution for all the atoms in the simulated structure 
And the calculation is fairly simple. You just take the charge of the atom and then divide, it, uh, divide that by the distance between the atom and the grid point. Right? Uh, it's a Euclid uh, Euclidean uh, distance. And then uh, you, you add that contribution to the potential. The, uh, this is a, a prox you can use approximation-based methods, such as cutoff summation and so on. Uh, but um, you know, we will cover that later, as I mentioned. So to visualize what's going on, um, we have these lattice points. Okay? And um, uh, we have all these atoms. So for every atom, we're going to need to calculate the, uh, the contribution to all the uh, potential points. And um, this can be a fairly ex uh, expensive process. And um, I want you to keep this picture in mind because um, it's going to actually play into how the computational efficiency and memory locality will begin to, um, to, to conflict and you, make, uh, you will begin to have some trade-offs. Okay. So this picture will help you to, to actually see why flops as a measure of your uh, algorithm will no longer be valid, whether you're programming for GPU or CPU. Okay. So um, you know what? The, the way that uh, um, we would uh, present a calculation is that uh, we're going to actually have a, uh, a piece of code that will just calculate a xy slice of the grid uh, potential, uh, potential grid uh, lattice. Okay, so even though the final result is a three-dimensional volume, uh, we're going to just have a piece of code that takes one slice of the xy plane and calculate all the um, all the lattice point potential, and then move on to the next one and the next one. And so uh, there are a few things. Energy grid is the pointer to the entire potential map. The grid is the dimensions, and the grid space is the model physical distance between the grid points. And um, uh, the atoms are the, um, you know, actually the atom data structure gives you the x, y, z coordinate and the charge of the atoms. So this should immediately give you a little bit of a, uh, set up a little bit of alarm because, you know, this is exactly an irregular input, right? You have to look into the atoms to be able to tell where, what their coordinates are. So without looking at the coordinate, you cannot tell uh, the distance, their distance between uh, the, the grid point, uh, the lattice points, and the uh, atom, right? So um, uh, the number of atoms is the number of atoms, uh, num apps, uh, atoms is the number of atoms in the uh, atoms array. So I'm going to begin to take you through the uh, uh, several pieces of code. And um, as Andrea was saying, you know, the best way to wake people up is to show a piece of code. Uh, I think that's what he said this morning. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, I can follow his act. Um, so this is a sequential C code. Okay, so there, there's, uh, I'm not showing anything parallel here. And um, uh, this is an input-oriented code. And it's very easy to spot. Because if you look at the, the loop, okay, the, the outer loop, this outer loop says, iterate from zero to num atoms. So you are going, you're going through the input atoms, right? So this computation is organized as uh, from the input point of view. So input oriented, it's going to be a scatter type, you know, uh, algorithm. So um, as soon as you get each atom, you calculate, you calculate the z value, okay? The, um, you take the, uh, the atom's z dimension, uh, coordinate, and uh, calculate the difference between, um, uh, between that and a particular z value. And the reason is, um, you know, remember, this whole slice is an xy slice, right? It's an xy plane slice. All of them have exactly the same z coordinate. So you should be able to just get away with calculating that z difference once for all the distances of all the grid point, uh, all the uh, uh, lattice points, right? So this is why it's computationally efficient. It it really tries to avoid doing any more uh, flops calculation than necessary. So then the next step is uh, so this is the z uh, part. And then you go into the 
the uh, the y dimension that uh, uh, that you you're going to be iterating with j. So whenever you iter uh, you you go to the next y value, you have a whole series of x points, right? They all share the same y value, right? That's going to be the horizontal lattice points in one single dimension. So they all share the same y dimension, uh, the y value. So you should be able to calculate the y component of that distance only once for all the lattice values, right? So this is exactly what we're doing here. We're calculating that um, the, the, the delta y and the, the square of it just once. And finally, we get into the, um, the, um, the, the x dimension. So we're iterating through all the um, uh, lattice values on that single line, right? So at this point, we can just use the y and z components of the distance that we calculated outside the loop. And we only need to calculate the, uh, the x difference by, uh, for, uh, for this particular lattice point. So this is a, you know, a fairly computational efficient algorithm. Um, I already mentioned all these things, so I'm not going to read the slides again, but it's going really for your benefit um, when, when you look at the slides uh, later on, okay? So for this particular application, just like the MRI situation, you know, the input is um, really irregular because the inputs are atoms from molecular structure and ions and so on. And they are, uh, they're irregular by necessity. They're all over the map here. Whereas the energy grid model is, um, you know, is a, a very regular space, um, you know, uh, uh, grids. And this is regular by design, okay? So I'm going to take you through the CUDA implementation. You know, based on the uh, the scattered um, the, the scattered uh, approach or input oriented programming, so um, the the CUDA kernel, if you look at sort of the overview, this is actually a uh, a fairly generic um, you know uh, structure that we're going to be using for both the scatter parallelization and gather parallelization. So we will allocate an initialized potential map memory on the host CPU. So this is what you will be doing regardless of uh, GPU. So you, know, you will be doing the same thing on the CPU if you're only using the CPU. And then you allocate the potential map slice. Remember, we're doing one XY slice at a time. So we'll be sending one slice over to the, uh, to the GPU. And then um, you know, uh, we, uh, we, we will send, calculate the slice on the GPU and then send it back to the CPU. And then we'll do the, uh, you know, we'll, after we finish, you know, uh, we, the whole thing, then we, you know, uh, we, we're done with the entire three-dimension uh, lattice point. And you're, you're going to ask me why you would uh, be sending the, uh, the slice uh, to the uh, GPU to begin with. It wouldn't that be zero? In general, if you have large enough input, large number of uh, atoms, oftentimes there's another level of tiling. That is, you will be taking a chunk of input do this, and then take another big chunk of input, do this again. And that's why you will be starting with your previous phase. Okay, so that, uh, that's is essentially how these, you know, this particular calculation is uh, set up. So let's go through the uh, scattered uh, parallelization first. Um, we will be using each thread to compute the contribution of an atom to all the grid points in the uh, current slice. So it, this is a scattered um, you know, computation. The kernel code largely corresponds to the CPU version with the outer loop stripped. So this is actually a, a very, very quick conversion from your C code to CUDA code. Remember that outer loop that iterates through all the, um, all the input atoms. So what you, would, uh, what you do is you take away that, out, uh, that, that uh, outer loop, and then um, you know, uh, essentially take the rest of the code and make them into a kernel code, okay? Fairly straightforward conversion. You can even tell your advisor it's very hard. You know, uh, then you can take a vacation. So um, then uh, each thread corresponds to an output outer loop iteration of the CPU version, and num atoms is used in a kernel launch configuration to make sure that you have enough threads to cover all the original sequential iteration for all the atoms. Right. So here we go. The code looks like this. Um, you know what? You, you take, we took away the outer loop, 
And then we, you know what, as soon as we get into the kernel, remember that vector addition example that we showed in the morning? Every thread needs to use the block index and thread index to figure out which input is supposed to be processing, right? The SPMD model. So, but as soon as you, you, you're done with that, then uh, you can calculate the Z. You can calculate the Z because Z is independent, right, of the entire slice. And then you go into the Y dimension, you calculate Y ones. And then you go into the x dimension, you reuse the z and y, just like what you had in the sequential code. So that's why I said this piece of code is literally minutes of work from your sequential code. Okay? That's why it's so attractive. You know, if you can get away with this kind of programming, you should not go into any more sophisticated programming. If the performance is sufficient, you should really spend your life in more vacations rather than more work. Okay? Only work if is necessary. And this needs to be done as atomic operation because you're writing into this energy grid and m multiple nodes, uh, uh, threads can write into the same location. Okay? And that's why you need to use atomic operation. There are pros and cons about this approach. It follows closely the CPU version. It's good for software engineering and co-maintenance. It preserves you know, uh, computational efficiency and uh, you know, uh, coordinates distance offsets of sequential code. The cons is that atomic at serialized execution, it becomes very slow. In fact, it's so slow that I would like to just say, you know, don't even bother to try it okay, for this particular piece of code. I used to get students to, to write this piece of code and try it and just so that they, they know how slow it is. But most of them just take my words these days. So you know what, I, I, I'm spearing you from one unnecessary exercise. So let's go back and take a look at you know, well, what a, you know, what a par parallel piece of code you know, well, needs to, uh, to be like. And I had a good lunch discussion with David uh, you know, well, today. And I, I said, you know what, well, every parallel piece of code always start with some overhead. You, you always get a little bit you know, uh, overhead and slow down somewhere when you try to parallelize it. And we're going to see this. Okay? And then uh, by the end of the day tomorrow, you will see exactly how the parallel code gets it back. That is, we not only do the parallelization, but essentially we still need to do a couple more algorithm strategies in order to get that efficiency back. So we're now sacrificing some efficiency, and then I promise you we'll get it back you know, uh, by the end of tomorrow. So the, this piece of sequential code will be theoretically slower, um, and uh, it's going to be an output-oriented piece of code. So um, the way that you can tell is that you're, you're going to be seeing the y dimension and the x dimension uh, the y dimension and x dimension in your outermost loops. So this piece of code is iterating through the potential lattice points. Okay? And for every lattice point that you're going to be going through, then you will actually uh, go through all the inputs. Okay? Go through all the input for every um, uh, lattice point. And taking those input atoms, you will calculate the atomic, um, you know, the uh, coordinate differences, and then you will do the uh, distance calculation and ca calculate the potential. You can no longer avoid doing the y and the z dimension. Oops, I'm, I think I'm out of battery. So you can no longer avoid doing the y and z um, dimensions in the innermost loop because every atom, okay, every atom is new, right? So when you go to the next atom, the atom is going to be, you know, a, a, a new x, uh, y, and z. And also, every instance of the innermost loop is dealing with a different y and z component, okay? So that's why you cannot avoid doing those kind of calculations anymore. So this is not a computational efficient algorithm. You'll be doing more um, you know, flops just to be able to calculate the same thing.
I am out of battery. Okay, so it's more redundant work. And um, so, on the other hand, there's some interesting uh, pros about that piece of code. First of all, there are fewer accesses to an energy grid array. And if you look at the, um, the code, because every innermost loop, instance of the innermost loop is accessing exactly one output point, you can actually accumulate that value in the end in a uh, in a register in a, a scalable uh, scalar array uh, variable, and eventually after you're you're done with that innermost loop, you can write it out to the energy grid. So you can avoid writing ma many many of the writes to the energy grid, okay? And you can just keep accumulating all the input you know, contributions to that that particular element and eventually write it out. And this is the basis of the highest CPU performance code that I will be showing you in about 10 minutes. Okay, but I want you to, to, to be aware that even though this thing is computationally inefficient, it actually avoids writing several writes, okay, multiple writes into the, uh, the energy grid. It consolidates many of the writes into the energy grid into one, okay? Um, it actually has a fairly simple code, data, uh, code structure. The cons are uh, many more calculations, uh, more access to the atomic array. Remember, now for every lattice point, you're going through the entire um, input array, right? So for the sequential code, you're now accessing, writing only once into the energy grid, but you're reading many, many times from the atomic structure. Okay, and overall, um, it, it will be a, a much smaller sequential execution due to the uh, sheer number of calculations performed. So, um, when we write a uh, develop this into a CUDA kernel, we need to actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, design the data structure a little bit. So, this is the opportunity for me, for me to show a couple of the uh, the, the algorithm. Uh, you know necessities that uh, that we do for these kind of you know calculation. Essentially, um, now that we are doing a output-oriented programming, our data structure needs to be properly aligned. That is, every thread is going to be writing into a uh, into a lattice point. So, whenever these threads write into the uh, the output, their output. We need to make sure that these threads are writing into what we call the coalesced, um, you know, a group of lattice points. So what that means in practice, you will take your data structure, and you will uh, pad them into multiples of, you know, a, um, half warp sizes, to make sure that all these data structures are properly aligned, and then um, you will be, you know, using each thread to write into one of the output, and so once we're done with that, then we, we, we know that um, another uh, important thing is, remember this particular group, if we didn't pad a data structure, then some of the threads may be writing outside the valid range of your uh, grid point. So you will need to do some kind of if-then-else statement for the entire kernel, okay? to always test, even though the test can only be true when you are executing the, 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 the block of threads that are operating at this range. But because we're using a SPMD single program multiple data model, that test has to exist for all the threads. And that's going to be you know, causing the overhead. Now, so um, with that setup, you know, well, we can actually um, you know, take the, the slower sequential code, strip off the outer loops, the Y loop and the X loop, into a single, uh, in, into, um, into a kernel. And so that when we launch the threads, we will launch a two-dimensional thread structure that cover the X and Y dimensions, okay? So um, 
then we will be you know, still doing the, uh, the X and Y calculation. The I and J now needs to be calculated based on the, uh, the block indices and the thread indices. So once you calculated those values, you know which lattice point you are supposed to be calculating right, as a thread. And then you will go into the calculation and um, you know, so this is in the innermost loop is essentially the same as that sequential code. So, you know, it's still a fairly quick conversion from your input code into the output code, but it's a little bit trickier because uh, you need to kind of push things around a little bit and then, you know, uh, settle them down and get, uh, you know, something like this. So, you no longer need to have the atomic operation, okay, because you know you're the, um, this thread is the only one that is going to write into that destination. So, um, you know, uh, this is a, um, you know, a gather based approach. Why is it a gather based approach? Every thread is going to iterate through the, uh, the atoms, all the atoms, right? So you'll be gathering all the relevant input for output point by iterating through the atoms, okay? So um, there's some further optimizations. So dz squared should be pre calculated and sent to the uh, in place of z. So remember, in the, in the sequential code, we calculate dz only once. But in this piece of code, every thread is going to be calculating dz. So you know what? This is a little bit of co-refactoring in, 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 in your application in order to use a kernel efficiently. So you will be calculating the dz ahead of time before you launch the kernel, OK? So you know, minor tuning. Gather kernel is much faster than the scatter, the scatter kernel because there's no serialization. And it's, um, you know, uh, uh, the compute efficient sequen uh, sequential algorithm does not translate into the fast parallel algorithm. And um, uh, so gather and uh, scatter is a big, a big um, you know, uh, factor. Now, I'd like to make an important um, comment. So that piece of code is a reasonable piece of code. It's reasonably fast. And that piece of code was actually used for a little while until John Stone move on to the, uh, the code that I'm going to be introducing tomorrow. So uh, there are some interesting observations. In the modern CPUs, remember when I talk about the, um, the, uh, the difference between CPU design and GPU design uh, in the morning, I mentioned that uh, there are some fairly large amount of L2 or L3 cache on CPU. In today's CPU, very, very often, it's more important to be able to keep as much of your data in the cache than trying to avoid doing floating point operations. It's already true in most of the CPUs today. So, um, the, um, you know what? It turns out that the input oriented, um, you know, scattered sequential code can actually give you very, very bad cache performance. The reason is, in these, you know, in, in these calculations, the output grids, the output, um, you know, uh, lattice points, tend to be very, very big. Okay, these are, you know, very big, uh, um, you know, grid structures. And David was uh, was alluding to this uh, today. You know, uh, remember, he, he mentioned something about the um, the oil field, you know, in Saudi Arabia, and you know, you need to have a huge number of grid points in order to be able to capture. It. The, the reality, right, of the simulation. For most of the molecular dynamic simulation today, any meaningful simulation tend to require a huge number of, you know, uh, of uh, lattice points. And um, so, you know, the energy grid is a very large array, typically at least 20 times bigger than your atom array, the in, uh, than your input array, okay? So, you know, in general, you, uh, the, the rule of thumb that, um, you know, Klaus Schottem's group use is that for any substantial simulation, you should account for about 20 times more lattice points than the input atom, you know, the structure. So the input-oriented code sequence actually sweeps through the um, the output grid points multiple times through the calculation. So let me take you back to that piece of code. So remember, the outermost loop is to, you know, to, uh, to iterate on the atoms, right? 
So when you take one atom, what do you do? You go through the, the inner egg, I and J loops, right? And you will be writing into all the elements in that slice, okay? So you'll be sweeping through a two-dimensional slice in the output. And what do you do then? You go back, you fetch another input, right? And you go through that whole slice again. The slice is so big that by the time you try to do that for the next item, your cache is already trashed. Okay, so all these writes into the um, into the um, the, the uh, uh, lattice points tend to be cache misses on the CPUs. Okay, so that's that's essentially what's going on from uh, for uh, for the simulation. So the fastest sequential code is actually optimized output-oriented code. If you look at the CPU code in VMD today, the fast CPU version, the fastest CPU version is actually optimized output-oriented code, or uh, optimized gather code. It looks like this. It will actually loop over the, um, the, the Z dimension, the Y dimension, and the X dimension, okay? And for each level, you will calculate, do a pre-calculation of those dis distance components, okay? The distance com components. For example, uh, for, uh, when you go into the Z loop, you will calculate Z, pre-calculate Z for all the atoms. So essentially, you will generate the z, the z, uh, dz square for all the atoms and store them into a auxiliary data structure. Okay, it literally generates another side data structure, and that side data structure contains the dz square. Okay, calculation for all the atoms. You need to remember that. You need to mem uh, essentially keep all the dz values for the atoms for this algorithm to work, and then. For all the y, when you go into the y loop, you do the same thing for the dy calculation, okay? So finally, when you go into the, uh, the, the x loop, then you will iterate through all the atoms. You will actually go through all the atoms again. And when you process all the atoms, you actually use the partial results that you pre-calculated before, okay? along with the, the, uh, the x value, and you calculate the distance, and you do the contribution. So this particular one is an interesting compromise. It actually reduces the number of flops somewhat by pre-calculation, so that avoids some of the floating point calculation. But it uses more storage proportional to the size of your input atoms, right? The number of input atoms. So you're going to say, well, you know, why would this piece of code give you better performance on a CPU? You're using more storage, right? You're declaring more, more array you know, uh, 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 components to, to store these pre-calculated results. The, the, the reason is, remember, the input is about 5% of the output size, right? The number of atoms is about you know, 1 20th of the output. So even with these additional arrays, you're still using far less cache storage than if you are sweeping through the entire output lattice, okay? So if you look at the calculation, what really happens is that you're going to be generate, you know, sweeping through the input three times, okay? Um, you know, in three places. And when you generate the input, you'll put them into the cache. And because those inputs are so small, you can actually keep the input you know, still in the cache. And then you will calculate all these you know, output values in the innermost loop, okay, in the innermost loop, and keep them in the register. And then you will write that out once. That's when you trash the cache, okay? And this particular style of coding gives you the fastest 
CPU code, up to four times faster today than the other way, okay, on a, on a real CPU hardware. So many people have made this observation, um, you know, in the past several years. Many people have been saying that if you optimize your code for the GPU, okay, if you optimize your code for the GPU, and then you translate it back into a sequential code on your CPU, you can actually get better performance. And what happened is that in general, things like this, okay? Because you will typically be starting with a input-oriented scatter code, and then you optimize for GPU and it becomes an output-oriented scatter code, and when you translate it back, it becomes something like this, okay? And it gives you better cache performance. And another important point is this. Everyone has been saying that you know, GPU programming is hard. And let me say, let me agree with that. CPU programming is hard. But CPU programming will, be, will not be any easier if you want performance. So essentially what we're saying is performance programming is hard, okay? And in the past, because of the, the, the frequency increase every year, we actually did not need to do performance programming. We really didn't do much about performance. Whereas because of the, the clock frequency has stopped, because, and then we need to rely heavily on the caches and the cores and the parallelism, now we need to pay attention. As soon as we pay attention, we need to do these kind of techniques. So it's not that hard once you understand the concepts, okay? The concept in this particular lecture is fairly simple. The concept is you take a input-oriented code and you look at the engineering aspect of it. Is the input data structure much bigger or much smaller than the output? If the input data structure is much smaller than the output, then a output-oriented programming can give you much better performance on both in, uh, CPUs and the GPU, okay? And um, so this essentially brings us to uh, a couple other things. Uh, one is, you know what, we need to have temporary array for uh, pre-calculated dz's and uh, dy, uh, uh, dy squares so, and so on. So why does this code better? Because the, uh, the cache performance you know, uh, is better. Now, what I didn't tell you is that a real GPU code actually also looks exactly like that. Okay? For, but we go through another step, which is called threat coarsening transformation. And that's going to be the topic tomorrow morning, okay? And that also sets the foundation of what we call the register tiling transformations, which is very important for stencil code and um, uh, for high-performance matrix multiplication, matrix vector multiplication. So uh, th that's why, you know what, by the end of tomorrow, my objective is for you to be able to visualize why high-performance CPU code and high-performance GPU code will have essentially the same fundamental structure. And the kind of transformations that you apply in one will most likely apply to another one. By Thursday, uh, Friday, what I would like to do is to be able to you know, show you, you know, what, um, the same type of transformation, which is you know, a tiling transformation that has been you know, used for CPU cache performance is gonna be critical for GPUs to reach its uh, peak performance. So hopefully we'll bring everything together. And there will be several missing you know, techniques, and, um, and, but on the other hand, if I can interest you enough, I, I would trust that you will go and uh, review all the concepts. Albert, did I miss anything before I let him go? Ah, okay. It's not a fair question because you know too much about these things. Uh, it is a great question. So uh, the question is this. Um, what Albert is actually asking is, is, is probably three questions um, because he actually knows um, more about some of these things. In, um, in the past, we tend to put the atom array into either the local memory, uh, the, the shared memory, or the constant memory. And the highest performance implementation tend to be in the constant memory. 
And then we need to actually uh, divide the input into chunks so that they, each chunk will fit into the 64K limitation of the constant memory. So what Albert is really asking is that now that we have caches in the Fermi you know, chip and above, do we still need to do those kind of you know, additional steps? The answer is actually, uh, you're right. Um, you know, uh, um, the atoms now can fit into the L2 cache and give you very comparable performance to the constant memory and uh, shared memory versions. That's absolutely right. So that's part of the simplification of programming. Uh, but that, that's actually a very good usage model for the Fermi cache. There are very bad usage models, but this particular one is a good one. Any other question? Since he agreed to be my TA, I, you know, I, I, I actually answered the question, even though it's not exactly the, uh, the fair question. But I, uh, I want to make sure that all of you who, have, who are uh, seeing this the first time actually get a solid. And, um, uh, I promise I would uh, end on time. So I will take one more question. So the, the question is this, if the output array is the same as the input array, right, would that, be, uh, would that cause problem? Absolutely. Um, the typical situation is um, there are some embodied calculations where you, know what, um, the, you are not just calculating the effect on some grid points. You are actually calculating the forces on, on, the, uh, on the input, and then you need to move the input. Okay? So for those kind of calculations, you cannot do pure input or uh, output oriented programming. And you need to actually do what we call the, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the bin based programming. And uh, it's actually one of those lectures that uh, you will not be hearing here, but um, you, know, you will be getting from the, uh, the semester level course. So if you're working on some large scale embody type uh, problems, um, you, know, you need to actually go further than the lectures here. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. So I'll see you tomorrow morning.